All right. Welcome. Uh, the show is What's Going On. I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez, and today is a special show. It's uh, our exit interview for Provost Dr. Paul Arcario, and uh, he's leaving LaGuardia at the end of June after 34 years of service to the college. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Arcario. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, and thanks to uh, see Christopher Pope behind the scenes, our technician, <laughs> helping us out too. So thanks to him and to Jamie Riccio and everyone. Thanks. Yes, you're part of the WLGR family. You had your provost space. I know. Which was the most popular show at, the, at, it, at its time. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you were doing it. That's what I was trying to say. Yes, they, yeah, well. <laughs> And I, you know, I, again, I apologize. I would, ideally, I would have loved to have done this live in front of an audience. And I just thought the logistics and everybody's concerns about COVID-19, yeah. it, it was going to be uphill, at, you know, at least. So No, no, these are the times we live in. No need to apologize. Right. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about the format. Uh, I wanted to start to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your background and your studies and, and life before LaGuardia. So why don't we start there? All right. Well, uh, I could go. I'll go way back, but I'll. It'll be fast in the beginning. I'm a. I'm a. I'm Queens born. Grew up. Uh, in fact, actually born in Rockaway Beach. Grew up in Ozone Park, Queens. Um, went to Brooklyn Technical High School here in the city, and then NYU, and eventually Columbia. So I'm, I'm very much New York City, product of New York City. Um, uh, I don't think everyone. You, knows that I was at Queensboro for six years before um, before LaGuardia. And in fact, uh, in 1982, uh, so I, was, I, I just finished teaching ESL in Taiwan for a year and a half um, and came back um, after that fabulous experience and um, got a job. There was a program called the Port of Entry Program at Queensboro. And it was a program, it was a cultural and language orientation for Chinese scholars who were just starting to come to the United States for advanced degrees. And um, so it was a wonderful program. I had a fabulous mentor, uh, Dr. Elliot Glass, who was the chairperson of the foreign language department, took me under his wing. We wrote books together. We produced uh, English language teaching video that was actually the first American English video uh, broadcast in the People's Republic of China, um, which was really thrilling. And uh, he said to me, if you're going to stay in higher education, uh, you better go get your doctorate. So at the time, I had my master's in, in, in English. And uh, so I went to uh, Teachers College. At Columbia, they had a wonderful uh, TESOL program up there. And um, so I was in the middle of that doctoral program, and there was an advertisement to hire three faculty members at, in ESL at LaGuardia Community College starting in fall of 1987. And you may remember there were some fiscal problems, the periodic fiscal problems that happened in the city. And um, because of the budget, we were actually delayed, the three of us, and we did not get we didn't get to start until uh, January of 1988. Um, so that's when I started. Back in the day, Academic ESL was actually housed with the English Language Center. Uh, our director was Gloria Gallengain at the time. And uh, that's where I started, seventh floor of the C building. And um, certainly looked very different than the seventh floor looks now. I mean, that's where, that's where humanities is now. Except, except for the uh, all the classes, and uh, what is it, uh, ten thousand small businesses? Yeah, it was sort of where, where that, where that, yeah, it was. Uh, it didn't look like the ten thousand small business space, though, as as you might imagine. At the time. But, I was going to ask two questions I had while you were talking. I was thinking, yeah. you said TESOL. so TESOL is teaching, teaching a, the speakers of other languages right teaching okay English speakers of other. Yes, and yeah. do you remember who the other two people were that you were hired with yes i do, do are they still around well um i'm uh one of them i see on a regular basis we're, we're still friends we started the same day we were office mates um right. and uh she actually left laguardia and went and taught many different places and actually just finished her career at Kingsborough for the last few years. And the other person has retired. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was the three of us. 
Dr. Riccio, who is this? I think this is coming from Chris. He's saying that my Twitch volume is on. So I don't know if he means there's something. I've just muted myself twice. So hopefully that's not coming through. Uh, yes. I was, so, you know, I know we have some ESL folks in our, in, in humanities and I meet ESL. Were you like a lot of these ESL folks who got into ESL for the travel aspect of it? Was that something that, that uh, interested you? I mean, Taiwan and everything? Not in the beginning. In the beginning, when I finished uh, in 1975, that was the year. Do you remember the New York Post, uh, or the Daily News headline that said, you know, Ford to New York yeah, dropped exactly. dead? It was, the city, it was the city fiscal crisis. Right. And quite frankly, there weren't teaching jobs to be had. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking for work. And um, the it was a place called the China Institute in America. It's still there up on 65th Street. It's in a beautiful townhouse building. They have a gallery and they have programs for um, in Chinese language, Chinese literature. And you go, they got a grant called a bilingual vocational educational grant. And they trained Chinese immigrants to be chefs in Chinese restaurants and taught English. So they advertised and I said, well, there's a job. Um, I, did, I didn't really, I wasn't really trained in ESL. I had a master's in English. And um, it was great. Half the class were, were in the facilities because they offered cooking classes to, to uh, you know, Americans as well. And so half the class would cook in the morning and the other class would have their um, English language. And then we'd all have lunch together and more English in the afternoon. So that was my first experience with ESL. And that's <laughs> got me interested in, <laughs> in Chinese culture. Um, and that's why after that, um, uh, I decided to go to uh, actually go off to uh, overseas when that opportunity came. And um, yeah, so what I, uh, my original intention was I need a job, really. Right. Yeah. And I, I was thinking, you know, in gardeners, what is, you know, gardeners, multiple intelligence is, is eating yeah. one of the, uh, one of the ways to learn. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can be, I, I, especially if yeah, you uh, I, get into mindful eating. Right. And later in I was also, we'll talk a little bit about later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about mindfulness because uh, that's my next chapter, but we'll save that for later. For you, of, yeah. yeah, the future, yeah, or greatest. And uh, uh, most yep. folks don't. Other know I had a little sidetrack. Also, after my uh, bachelor's degree, I went to Fordham Law School. Wow! And after one semester, I said, "This is really not for me." <laughs> well, it's that first semester that's the the make or break semester, isn't it? Yeah, usually? you know, you're doing. I, it, I'm, I just realized this was not really the kind of work that I wanted to do. I had worked my way through college. I worked in a in a uh, high-end law firm. It looked very glamorous. Um, <laughs> it was. Um, but after a semester in law school, I said, this is not really what I want to be doing. So I, and that's when I went back for my master's. Yeah. Yeah. I go back and forth with that, but you know, I'm, you know, all the reading, all the studying is, uh, that I, though I enjoy arguing <laughs> and that's, and I, you know, but my, my ex-wife who was an attorney used to talk about how most attorneys rarely litigate yeah. unless you find yourself, you know, in a public service sector job like that. Uh, we can we can move in since since you've talked about about so 1987 you come to LaGuardia, mm -hmm. and so you were with Telk and uh, how long did that go on? How long were you with Telk? Well, I was not academic ESL was housed with Telk. I was not I part see. of the the uh, continuing ed faculty. I was. The academic, I was an academic faculty tenure track hire. Um, actually, I was hired as an instructor because I didn't have my doctorate yet. And then right. in, I think it was probably 1990, probably um, when, uh, just about when Ray Bowen came in, um, the academic ESL was split and brought into housed by itself in the academic division, uh, no longer under TEL. So that happened, I believe, probably in 1990. And um, shortly after that, um, uh, I finished my doctorate in 94. And my fellow colleagues in ESL said to me, why don't you become the chair? <laughs> so All right. um, I said, really? 
I, oh yes, you know, it's good for your career, et cetera, et cetera. So it was not really a goal of mine, but um, I said, okay, you wanted me, they elected me uh, as the chair of the SL program. And so that was in 1994. And um, actually, I guess my predecessor in that role was Nancy Erber, Professor Nancy Erber, since retired. And um, then we moved over to the, e, the e, you know, the e-building just opened right around that time. We didn't have the e-building. And then we- moved And this was, what, what year was this? About 1990. Oh, 1990. Yeah, okay. yeah, so we moved over into the second floor of the e-building where there were offices at the time. Not now, it's the library. And there, and right. we moved over there. Absolutely. And uh, and this is, and ESL was its own department at that you time, know, right? You know, it was one of those odd status. It was a program, but um, it was independent. It was not officially a department. So I was an unofficial chair, and it was very odd. Um, it, it, it was just one of those peculiar governance anom uh, anom anomalies that happened at the time. So I would go right. to college wide P and B and present, but uh, I didn't have a vote. And then we decided, you know, this is not really working out too well. Um, yeah. So eventually, you know, we became, um, we, well, actually, we became a department a little bit later on when we when we merged with. Uh, I actually, you know, created that bringing education and um, modern languages and esl into the EA, into the ela department so that was one of my one of my creations I re, well i just remember and i remember because anna maria hernandez tells always told me the story of when modern languages left humanities it had originally been in, in humanity i don't know if they were where they are to this or, or they were when i became full-time mm -hmm. uh in that corner of the e-building under the president's office few, and merging together so it gave them and an opportunity and, to expand and, and grow exactly Absolutely, you know and the what was really great was that so many of the faculty can do multiple disciplines in there um we have the sl faculty who would teach modern languages we have a an education faculty member who can teach uh esl so there's a lot of synergy going on and i think it's i think it was a good a good creation <laughs> so yeah yeah and and so you were the first chair of that. And how long did you to continue as a chair? Oh gosh, you know, um, 19, 1998. You know, I'm trying to remember if I was the first chair of that, or if I, or if that became that may have been after I became dean. I'm, I'm a little foggy on the timeline for that. Um, that may I, I can't remember what year that was created after I became assistant dean or before somewhere in that period. So in 1998, um, it was a kind of a funny story. Um, you know, many times people ask me, people have some, you know, desire or, or considering becoming an administrator, and they ask me my path. And I always say it was really very much um, kind of an accidental path. And I always tell people, you know, do a good job no matter what you're doing. And um, sometimes opportunities will come your way. Um, in, in, I guess it was 1998, Gail Mello was between jobs. She was going right. to become, you may, I don't know if you were here at that point, were you? No, well, I, you know, I started as an adjunct in 94. Okay. But it was in those days, photography, where I was exclusively teaching mm -hmm. under Bruce Brooks, was in the L building. Oh yeah, and they had this. They had this kind of the the tech at the time. Uh, Ed Coppola used to basically say like, "Oh, don't worry, we'll take your time sheets. We'll go get your mail." Right. So, in many times, I would never even enter the E building, but I was an adjunct for most of that period in the early '90s for for photography. Oh, okay. Uh, so, and I didn't have any in those years. You didn't I didn't have, have any real contact yeah. that much with full time faculty was, right. or particularly of any other department right. so i was so i didn't even was oblivious to who the who, who the, the president might be right. at a given time right. but i but when gail did her exit interview with us she told that story about coming at first she came as a visitor for one semester uh George, right. so the, in those days we had deans and associate deans we didn't have vp titles it was a dean so george hamada was the dean Gail came for one semester before she went to Gloucester Community College. And I was, as a chairperson, 
of the ESL program, um, we had, you know, meetings every couple of weeks with George Amada and Gail Mello as the associate dean. So I got to know her that semester. And at the end of the, in June, when she was leaving, she said to me, well, you know, I'm leaving and I really think you should apply for this job because you'd be great. And I thanked her and I did not, I did not apply. I wasn't, <laughs> Why not? wasn't what I was looking to do. Um, well, then at the end of August, George Hamada calls me in and said he's going off to become president. <laughs> he's bringing in George right. Sussman, who I didn't know at the time, from Central. And he said to me, I'd like to appoint you as interim dean because you know the college. George doesn't know the college. And I said, oh my gosh, I didn't apply for the job. It's being handed to me now. I better take it. Right. Some, the universe is telling me something. So I, I took it. Yeah, how many times they have a knock? It, right? <laughs> knock, knock, knock. Let me in. So I took it as interim. Then eventually, you know, we did a search and, and I applied and I was assistant dean. And one thing led to another, then associate dean, then dean. I got promotions. And then in 2013, I guess, um, I went through the search and became provost. Yeah, but you so you've jumped a lot because I, you know, I started being more of a fixture at the college in the early what I call them the aughts, right? Right, like 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, and Peter Katopis was here, yes. and you guys were kind of as I slowly moved into my full time role, uh, you guys were a team, yes. right? Yes. And uh, and he would, in fact, he I think he was the first one to be given the provost title. When we determined the college determined we needed a provost, right? You know, I that's a good question. I guess John, because John Bin was first when Gail came in. Um, she appointed John Bin, and um, you know what? I can't remember if he had provost title or just vice president title. He might have just had the vice president title. So John, yeah, because John Bin, yeah. you know, former chair of science. So John was five years, and then Peter was five years, right? And brought yes, in, right? Yeah, Peter came from from SUNY, and then he well, he was made provost, and then he when Gail took a sabbatical. Yes, he, he became was, uh, interim, I guess it would be, or acting president for the semester. Right. Yeah, and then he moved yeah. on, and you became the provost, or you became, you know, you moved into that role, and I can't remember who came in. Uh, was it? Did Brett come in as your number? As as who was in that other office? I always think of it as the two Brett, offices. Oh, the other office could... was Brett for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it was Brett for, well, that, for was that my period office time until. Me. Then, then Brett was in there for a number of years. And then you moved in there. Yes. And the you know, I mean, the provost role, as I remember it, is creation, and I can't remember if it came out of Middle States. That that first the Middle States I was involved with when Gordon had been the chair. And the notion was with all these vice presidents and all these different divisions, and then we were trying to work out the the alignment, yeah. the realignment, and it it was it was and even though, as the, I think even though as the vice president of academic affairs, it was always assumed. I forget what the term was. Bob Kahn once had a phrase for it, like in a room of equals, you are still the you're the, you're more equal than everybody else, or or the greater the greater. Well, but it, uh, it, it, it was but, not set up, Hugo, that all of the VPs uh, right. reported to the provost. But was set up, remember, we were really trying to align at the time academic affairs and student affairs. So it was right. set up that student affairs VP would report to the provost. We did that for a few years. That's when Michael Baston was here. Oh, right. So it was getting student affairs and academic affairs right. to work together. Yes. Exactly. I always assumed you answer. Uh, everybody answered to you. No, everyone did not before the president. <laughs> no. Except my interim year as president, and except for that. Well, then it's and then of course when Gail left, you were president, and then uh, Ken came along, and you were, you were provost again. Yes. What was that like? That 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 trans again? You were you found yourself in a role that you had not asked to be in, right? And then. Well, you know, um, I mean, I was I I had agreed to be interim president, assuming that I mean, Gail was very supportive with that. And, uh, you know, I agreed to that. Of course, little did I know it would be the, the pandemic year. Uh, right. In March of that okay. year was a very challenging year. And, uh, you know, I had just lost my my life partner that 
in Tom. that year, the August of that year. So it was uh, looking back. I'm not. I don't know. I don't. It's not quite know how I got through that year, but um, it it. I mean, the pandemic just colored the whole year. I mean, that was you know it was all right. it was all about that. And uh, it was a very you know challenging year for all of us, right? I mean, going completely remote in a week. When I look back, how the faculty did that, the, the, the job you all did doing that was it wasn't remarkable. it wasn't pretty. <laughs> oh, no, I know, but it was. But you did it. But you did it, and you accomplished it. Well, it's it's hilarious because I think the numbers were I think maybe fifty percent of the faculty had been had 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 some experience with Blackboard before the pandemic. And then, of course, everybody was was you know forced to use that initially. I think Zoom helped out. I think so. the ease of Zoom right. helped. And however, anybody negotiates anything besides just the face to face inter right. or the live interaction. Right. But but, but it was you know, know, before the pandemic, we were offering about six percent of our classes either hybrid or huh? online. That's it, all. I remember. Yeah, and I remember that Milliken was always kind of pushing us to try to increase that and you know of course the issue was always competing with SPS which is you know all online whatever well, it they is. were but definitely you're right the community central was pushing it you know we didn't go all in around pushing that I mean you know I always I don't like you know I don't like to I'm the kind of person I like to be hands-on and I I I can take the higher level view but i also like to be roll up my sleeves and you know what's going on so you know when when that push was coming for cuny i taught um a hybrid course myself just to see what like, what is it like so i did intro to linguistics as a hybrid uh one night a week and then the rest was and um it was you know it's like i want to know what the experience is like you know so i can talk to faculty about it as well and I actually, to tell you the truth, I, I like the hybrid mode. I don't think I would have liked fully online, but I did like the hybrid mode at the time. So this was, they were online and they would come in to see you? Once a week. So that we'd have one in session, one, one night a week, and the rest was online. So it was, it was a hybrid. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah, that would be a good way to, uh, to introduce it, particularly for students to figure out, you know, to, to mm -hmm. keep the connection because I mean, what what you you what was your experience with? I guess the hybrid made it tough. Because I'll tell you personally, it was not easy. That kind of having to negotiate this the machine to, and where they could turn off the screen, they could turn off the sound, and how are you getting through? Yeah. The hybrid uh, is very up. different than <laughs> a complete online. We didn't have there was no synchronous right. element. The sync there was no we didn't use Zoom. We didn't have Zoom. There was nothing right. synchronous. I saw them in person, and that made a big difference. Um, yeah. You know the, the what I remember. One of the things I remember most is that um, I was always worried. You know, like many of us, I enjoy the personal interaction, and I was worried. You know, am I going to lose some of that? I didn't for two reasons. Number one, because I saw them in person. And number two, yeah. the other thing that was a surprise to me is how much they revealed and opened up online. You know, they would write things to me online, personal things that right. I think sometimes is hard. You know, if they have 15 minutes in between class, running to class, they're not going to maybe stop with me and say, gee, you know, whatever, I have this going on in my personal life. But online, they would do it. And I think, you know, generations now are much more comfortable with with saying things like that you know online not not to the whole group but there was a lot of that and that was something that was a that was a surprise to me um all of the yeah. online work was you know asynchronous um everybody was doing it sunday night because i can see one sunday night. that's yeah, when right. they had time that's that worked <laughs> for them right so i think that was a positive for them because the sunday night was clearly a time what was it due monday was it due much? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, strict deadlines and and everything else. You know, for my own training, I took a um, a semester the semester before because we didn't have as much training available um, as as was put into place during the pandemic. So I took right. a completely uh, online course from UCLA in linguistics the semester wow. before. Uh, just to see how it was set up, and then also I needed a little refresher in linguistics. And um, of course. oh my gosh, Tomonori Nagano was—he gave me—he had so many 
because uh, he had been doing, I think, some hybrids. He had a lot of material that he shared with me. It's like I couldn't have got gotten through it without him, um, you know, being a support. And uh, and I know that was true during the pandemic, right? All faculty oh, yeah. supported we all came each together. other with your online. How are you doing right. it online? Dr. Riccio, who's uh, ghosting us right now as she watches the show, is you know she made that she was the support for humanities. It's one it's one thirty. I just want to do a quick station okay. break. So uh, it's one uh, you're watching what's going on. I'm your host Hugo Fernandez here on LaGuardia Web Radio, and today my guest. I always go back to I just look at it so I don't get it wrong, but it's our provost, Dr. Paul Arcario. Uh, this is his exit interview, and Dr. Arcario is leaving LaGuardia at the end of June after 34 years of service uh, to the college. And we're moving into that section of the show that I talked about, what I call the greatest hits, or what, what you know, you feel you're, you're most proud of as far as the things either that you were involved with mm -hmm. or created uh, or did sure. here at the college in, in that time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I want to preface it by saying, um, you know, I. I don't do anything, I've done nothing by myself or alone. I mean, this is a very collaborative, I mean, one of the things I love about LaGuardia is how collaborative it is, um, you know, how we work across disciplines. It's been just um, just wonderful colleagues who are so mission-driven. Everyone is mission-driven at this and believes in what we're doing. So, um, you know, it's one of the things that's kept me here for 34 years. So a couple of things. Um, one of the things I, I got to do very early on in my first year as assistant dean, um, Ray Bowen was a president, and he told the director of grants at the time was Kitty. Well, um, I learned a lot about grant writing from her, and the president said, I would like the college to get a Title III grant. That's a big federal government grant. And that was actually that year was the first time they split it off into Title V for HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution. So we decided to apply under the HSI category. Um, and um, that was really my first big grant. I'd gotten a small one before that. And um, very proud of that work. That created the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, Ooh. And I, I think that's certainly one of one of the things I've been most proud about because I, I, I think you know I firmly believe in in professional development and supporting our faculty. Um, so that created created the Center for Teaching and Learning, um, created our our first really I think, well maybe there there might have been other peer programs before that, but that part of that created the Student Technology Mentors. Um, you know, you go, the faculty, believe it or not, faculty had only just gotten computers like a year or two before that. <laughs> it seems like when I say that, I say, oh, what year? Geez. What year is this? What year are we talking about? 89. And uh, so the grant was to, to develop uh, technology supported pedagogy. It's like, well, you have the computer, how are you going to use it in pedagogy? It was very logical. And, um, Roberta Matthews was interim president. So I guess it was 89, just before Gail came. And I went to her and I said, you know, you have to say how you're going to institutionalize, you know, these grants, which is always hard to do. And I said to her, I think the Center for Teaching and Learning should be permanent. That's how we're going to institutionalize it. And she was on board for that. And we said, well, we'll figure out how to fund it, you know, when the grant is over, So, which we did. So um, very proud of that. And a couple of years after that, I was at a conference. This is very funny. This is the only time in 34 years that I went to a conference overseas. And it was the vice president for uh, student affairs at the time wanted to go to the first, the international first year experience conference in London, my one and only international trip. Went all the way there, for a team. We were all going to come back with the project. I went to a proposed a conference presentation from Marist College here in New York, seeing it in London on e portfolio <laughs> on e portfolios. Oh. I came back and I said, "So it begins." Yeah, so it begins. <laughs> <laughs> so I came back and I did a Title Five, another Title Five grant for e portfolios, and uh, so I, I was the lead writer on that. Uh, Brett Einan was very enthusiastic about taking that on, so we sort of housed it in the center, and the rest is history on that. Um, but I will say that um, also related to that, you know that's how we do assessment, 
And I'm right. very proud that we that we do assessment by looking, it's, it's authentic assessment, looking at actual student work. Back at the time, the big thing was external assessments and exams. And you remember we had the CPE exam as an external, I don't know if you know that. Well, I, yeah, I, but that was for students coming in, or that was when they were leaving, leaving. right? So there was a lot them. of talk about right. doing assessment, you know, externally. And I really believe that our faculty should do it you know, internally looking at actual student work, because then that's how you can actually, you know, improve and make changes based on actual right. work. So I, I'm very proud of, of the assessment work. You know, it was hard. I mean, everybody was like, oh, assessment, you know, but um, look, I mean, we just got six, what did we get? Six categories, six standards got commendations in middle states, including <laughs> assessment, you know, and, and right. so that's that's been important work as well. Um, Another thing very close and near and dear to my heart is the provost learning space. And, um, you know, most of uh, probably by now, I think all of the full time faculty have participated. I really wanted in particular and when looking at annual evaluations, um, I really wanted a strong sense of the faculty's voice in terms of their inquiry into their teaching. I mean, that's what it was about, you know, it's like none of us have a down pat, right? There's always room for improvement and it should be an inquiry process. You know, what is the question you want to look at and what are you going to try um, and how are you going to assess it? And you know what, if it didn't work out, you know, fine. What did you learn from it? Um, and, uh, you know, that process is still going on. And, you know, I read, you know, in, uh, in promotion documents and annual evaluations. I read these and some of the projects are just, you know, they're really terrific. It's really a genuine inquiry. And I, I, I'm very proud of, you know, encouraging, encouraging that. Um, oh, I'm going to keep going. I have a little list, but I don't know if I'm going to I was going to say, it looks like you're, lo you're looking I at have something a, there. I have a list. <laughs> I said, did that, because I have to remember, like, what did I, what am I, what I have know. I been doing for, for all this time? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, um, you know, also all of the work around um, remediation uh, that's happened. And I will say that, you know, CUNY wa was pushing the so-called COREC model, but here at LaGuardia, you know, we, we got to that before CUNY ever talked about it. And um, right. I, had, I was in conversation with the English department and the English faculty, and I said, you know, they, they were aware of it, and I had seen there's a, it was a program at Baltimore Community College. It was basically this co-rec model. And I said, if you guys want to go down and look at it, you know, and see. And the group of faculty went, and they came back, and they were enthusiastic, and, you know, we piloted that. So we had a co-rec model before CUNY was pushing it. Um, and, um, you know, worked very closely with math over the years. I'm kind of, you know. I think everyone knows the story. I took remedial math one semester myself just so that I can really be able to engage in that kind of conversation. That was quite funny. Um, I was going to say, what was that like? Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> um, number one, I didn't remember any algebra. <laughs> right. I know. And there, the talk, there was a weekly talk among the math faculty, like, you know, how, how's the dean? I, mean, I guess I was a dean at the time. How's the dean doing in Math 96? So, I mean, <laughs> I had to study because it's like I couldn't be embarrassed and fail Math 96. So I actually had to put in the study. Um, and then, you know, I made observations and, and I did a whole presentation for the math department and we talked and we ended up, you know, doing some grants and working with them. And, um, but it was really funny. You know, the professor at the time, it's like, who wants the dean to sit in all of their classes the whole semester yes, nobody that's frightening. No, it's frightening right right so yeah. the professor said to me you can do it only if you take all the exams i'm sure he thought that was going to be the end of that said, right get I ready said, i'll take the exam <laughs> 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 which i was sorry oh my gosh i'll never remember i'll never forget i should say the last weekend before the cramming for the finals <laughs> so, um but again, you know, I think, you know, you've got to roll up your sleeves and 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 talk with people and get involved and know what you're talking right. about. And so, you know, I think that was really that was really important. All that work around around remediation. Um, 
You know, I, I'm again, I, we talked earlier, I was very happy to really create the ELA department. I thought that was terrific. I was involved um, in some grant support, you know, launching our first science uh, programs. We did not have a separate science department. Uh, that science was part of health. It was one department. And we right. separated the department out. We got some grant support and created the, the first uh, science majors at the college. Other than the, we had the AS math and science, but we created biology and environmental science. I was very happy to be supportive of those programs. And um, so that's, you know, that's that was really great. I, I mean, advising first year seminar, you know, uh, certainly involved in all of that. And um, again, you know, when we're developing for first year seminar, I, I taught that as well the new the new model one of the uh, lif what was that like for you because i'm teaching i'm teaching two of those sections i've taught one before uh, different models actually well, uh, one is a three hour one's a one hour and now i'm going to be teaching both again i'm going to be teaching two three hour models and three one hour models well i will say that um i mean i i mean i one of the things i really miss the most is is the classroom because i i do love teaching and uh, I took it on and I had, um, um, I asked another staff member up here who was working in first year programs, he's, he's not here anymore. Um, and I said, would you like to co-teach with me, you know, um, because I was, it was a Friday class and it's like, oh, sometimes, you know, last minute I have something at CUNY or something calls me away and I, and I don't want to like, you know, pop in substitutes. So we co-taught it, which was really great. And um, so that sort of, you know, helped with the time pressure of it. But um, it was terrific. And, you know, I spent a lot of time working closely with the um, student success mentor who was facilitating the studio hour. Um, he now actually works here at the college. And, you know, it was a great, a great experience. And um, I think it's, to this day, I, I think it's an important course. Um, I, I, I love that it's by discipline and that the faculty are teaching it, you know, and the data show, you know, certainly improved outcomes with it. And, um, you know, I really think that was really something very important to establish. And, um, you know, it took, it took, it was a heavy lift to do and we, just, we wanted it to be credit bearing and, you know, credits are hard to come by um, with a 60 credit degree. But in most cases, we've been able right. to do that. So, you know, that's, I think that was really very important. And, um, the other thing I do want to mention um, that I'm also proud of is, you know, uh, in my year as interim president that I brought the governance into the executive council, you know, both mm. faculty council and the Senate. And, you know, and uh, I'm so pleased that that Kenneth has kept that model. And I think it really is very important and I think it works very, very well. So um, I'm, I'm happy to have done that, you know, for sure. So I don't know. Maybe I'll stop with the. <laughs> I, I was going to say you got three minutes. It, what's it's, what's fascinating is that you don't say, "I steered the college through one of the most difficult times as a rookie president," <laughs> and I and, and you know you transitioned between a president, you were interim president, and the hiring of an expert. Which, by the way, you know, Gail leaving after twenty years, mm -hmm. and then Ken stepping into that role. Uh, well, let me, that's, I'll, I'll tell you, that's a major accomplishment, yeah, no? Yeah, yeah, no, abs absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, the COVID was extremely, you know, challenging for all of us. And, and, and that was something uh, to get through. And, you know, we, we managed and that was certainly all, all hands on deck, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> and I will say this, um, you know, I thought about retiring after the interim presidency. So oh, this would be good to leave on this note. But there were two things. Um, number one, um, I probably was the administrator. I know I was the administrator with the longest institutional history and middle states was coming up. So I really felt right. I really should stay for middle states. And, and also, you know, I didn't know who the new president was going to be. I mean, I knew Kenneth Adams, but I didn't know him. I, I knew that was the name. And I right. said, I, I really feel I should help with the transition um, for a new president. So um, helped with the transition. Um, 
I have to say I, I love working with Kenneth. I think he's he's doing a great job. He put in so much effort that first year. Can you imagine walking in his presence? I did not meet Kenneth Adams in person for a year. <laughs> a year. Right. I mean, say you physically. Physically, yeah. It was Zoom. That right. was it. He started in August. I met him the next August. And, um, you know, he put in, as you know, a tremendous effort to connect. I mean, imagine having to connect with everyone not in person because we were totally remote that first year. And, you right. know, he put in the work and the effort. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I said, you know, too bad I like working with you so much, You're making me hard. It's harder to retire. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm really pleased with his success. And, and, um, and I think the college is, is, is in good hands. Um, and I'm thrilled, you know, one of my better decisions was appointing Reem and Justin as the Middle States co-chair. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Yes. That, that yeah. worked out fabulously. And also, you know, only the year earlier, we hired Nara, uh, Nava, Lara, and Nava has been, of course, fantastic. And that team really, I mean, the Middle States, I mean, I mean, Hugo, we just didn't, you know, we didn't just pass Middle States. I mean, it was flying colors. And again, yeah. you know, that reflects 10 years of of work um that that everyone has been doing at, you know at this college so um I, yeah yeah so high notes yeah so high yeah note. so i feel it's like the timing is right now and i feel i'm leaving on, on on a high note i mean you know i mean we have the challenges but i think you know the enrollment and the budget but enrollment will start to build back you know i, I i'm confident, well, I was I'm confident say in that you can't if you're if you're waiting for a time to leave when there there isn't going to be a challenge. Oh, forget about it. Exactly. <laughs> so we're we're in the last quarter hour, and this is an opportunity. I don't actually. It's interesting. That, let's see. Oh no, this is Jamie just encouraging people to ask questions, and we actually have a little bit of an audience. We got some folks oh, nice. watching. Uh, but with since we're without questions, uh, I wanted this. Is, this is an opportunity for you to any advice you would like to share for those of us who. Uh, we'll continue to deal with the challenges that, you know, on a, on a, whatever it is, a, a day to day well, or whatever it is. You know, I would say to, to me, and I think that one of the most important thing um, is to interact, to always interact with your colleagues out of a sense of mission. You know, we disagree. That's right. On how to achieve the mission. That's, that's what should happen. Right. You think we, Yes, we do. We do that. <laughs> but I don't interact with people out of that level. I interact that right. underneath that. You want this place to be successful. You want our students. It's You all believe in our students and want our students to be successful. And I just, I always just tell people just like, if you need to every day, remind yourself of that. And that really then right. helps with the surface conflicts, which is really at a surface level. And and that's, those kind of things should happen. There should be disagreements that, you know, that's fine. Um, and I think that's the most important thing, you know, to remember. I mean, that's that's what it's about. Um, I will tell you, you, go, you know, I am so grateful to have had my career at this college. Um, you know, not everybody has a career that the work is, is truly meaningful to them. You know, this is we get a chance to do meaningful work. Um, and not every, and, and that, that's, you know, that's, that's so great. Um, the other thing, um, so that's what, sort of my, my big, that's like the big thing I would say. Um, and, 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 and I really believe that, um, we need to nurture each other and, and take care of each other and respect each other and value each other. And remember everyone, you know, has a place at the table, everyone, um, and um, you know, I, I'm I'm thrilled that you know we have we have Wendy now as our chief diversity officer, and the DEI work is so important going forward. And you know, a place for everyone at the table. You know, and and, and that's something you know that's that's so important. Um, and taking care of each other. Um, so I will tell you this: that I'm not going to be entirely gone next year. So we just got um, a large grant 
just found out last week, and this is a grant I've been working on with uh, Professor Kun Yum in uh, psychology, and Ellen Quish and Eric. Um, we're going to be introducing mindfulness uh, in the first year seminar for those people who would like to sign up and do that. Yeah. So this is sort of my next chapter. I'm just I've been doing a lot of studies. I'm about to be certified as a mindfulness meditation instructor myself. And um, so this is sort of my next gig. And so I'll be working a little bit on this grant. Um, I won't be here that much, but doing I'll be doing some of the uh, the uh, teaching the teacher workshops that we're setting up for the fall and working with some of the students online. So um, yeah, so I'm really excited to have some some connection still, and uh, this work is very important to me, and um, so excited. So you still may see me around a little bit. I expected no less. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but it's hard uh, to go from a hundred zero, nine, right? It's like, yeah, of course. Uh, from, uh, and it's good that you're bringing your own money, right? <laughs> Why not? Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Help me out with the mindfulness. So how does, how, what was the thinking behind the application and how we think it's going to, it's going to pay off for, again, student outcomes when you were talking before and we get into these pitched battles between staff. Yeah, I, I always say this. these solutions, go, student um, outcomes. Students coming to the wellness center, 81% coming for anxiety. That's the data. Right. So, and there's just the, the normal anxiety, if I can use the word normal, but everything is exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, you don't have to look far to see that, you know, especially among young people, there's lots of mental health issues. Um, so right. this is not, this is not a magic bullet in any way, but it's something that we feel can be, be helpful. It's also something, you know, mindfulness now, uh, I hope it's not becoming a fad, but it's become very big in the, in the culture. Um, and right. um, I think it's also something that for many of our students, that's something that they've not had the opportunity uh, to be exposed to. So um, we're using, we'll be, um, uh, Kuhn has been working uh, on a PSC grant for the last three years. Um, she uses the uh, UCLA, uh, has a mindfulness center. They have a free app, so we'll be using that. She's been using that with her students, and actually we have the director of the UCLA Mindfulness Center is going to come and help launch this for us, so uh, we're excited about it. And it's very much, it's very much a pilot and an experiment to see. You know, we did two focus groups, a focus group of students here and a focus group at CUNY that was part of the grant application to see, you know, I don't like to just impose something, but see if the students are interested. It was a tremendous amount of interest among them. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll be gone. There'll yeah. be a call coming out very shortly for, we're looking for, I think, 10 folks teaching FYS to, to participate with us. So, yeah, you would think I'd be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I should apply. Uh, my experience with that population, and I can say this all the time, is, and I relate to them, is, you know, they all, we all, they all come for different reasons, mm -hmm. you know, typically they're being, you know, encouraged by their, by their families as, you know, whether they think it's, that's the way to go or, mm -hmm. and a lot, I mean, it's interesting because I've, I'm working with arts students. Mm -hmm. So these are just, these are, and I don't think a lot of parents push their kids into art. <laughs> uh, nobody's pushing anybody into art. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. And, uh, so it would be, but it, but I do, I think it's important, and that obviously that's that's the question that I ask on the first day of class, is why are you here? Mm -hmm. And because I believe if they don't know why they're here, how are they going to succeed? At you know what what's your goal? And uh, but I'll be I'd be interested to see how that plays. I and I, like you say, I know I, I'd be interested in what that eighty one percent of the anxiety is about. Is it coming from? Because I've been told, you know. You know, I certainly create enough anxiety in my urban study writing intensive courses. <laughs> and pay, you know, whatever I'm asking for papers, or or they have to do a blue book midterm or you know essay or, or final. Uh, well, there's but, uh, always you know. anxieties. It's not about you know. It's more your relationship yeah. to anxiety. It's not like or how you how you respond yes, to it exactly. So, well, I'll keep you you know posted. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I remember Michelle Manukio talked a little, Manukian spoke a lot, a great deal about it when she when she still went by by Piso. Yeah. She she talked about mindfulness. I remember the Center for Teaching and Learning doing it, uh, I'm, and I know it's effective because people have certainly been talking about it long enough. Oh, there's so, a lot of research. How a lot of uh, research behind it. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to give you an opportunity. Any last words you want to share? Anybody you want to thank or anything you want to say before uh, we finish your, your interview? Well, as, as I've already said, I'm, I'm, um, I'm just filled with gratitude um, for having had this opportunity to be 30 years at, at, at LaGuardia. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, gosh, I think everybody that I've worked with, um, so many people, it's been, um, it's been a privilege and an honor. And I know people, you know, used to say that, but deeply a privilege and, and truly, truly, truly an honor. Um, I'm, I'm so fortunate um, to have been here and there's plenty, plenty more to have to happen and do and, and grow. And um, there's always something. Um, remember, 25th anniversary, this slogan, right? The little tradition of innovation. It goes on. Uh, and I'm sure that, that, that it'll continue to go on. And um, I'll, be, I'll be watching. And I'm sure I'll be seeing, wow, look, look what they're doing at LaGuardia now. And I'm sure it'll be incredible. Um, and something that will really just you know, benefit our students. You know, that's, that's, that's who it's all about. So. Anyway, all right. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get teary if I keep going on. So, <laughs> I yeah. You know, I just want to say that it's been interesting, like listening to you talk about what you feel are your greatest hits, is like what Laguardia's greatest hits. So it's you know it's been you know good to to hear about you know the fact that you you were in you were in the center of a lot of the things that have helped us stand out, and you probably take a lot of credit for that. Those six outstanding awards, and I mean both both middle states. So, and that's why it's it's great to hear someone tell their own story. So, thank you for all for all your service for the college. Thank, and you, thank you. you. Thank you. Looks like I'm losing I'm losing connection on my keyboard, so I don't know what's going to happen next. But uh, again, and we talked about this before the show. We we'd like to dedicate this show to your partner, Don Don Walker, who passed, and like you said, passed uh, right about the same time that ever, that all the other things happened that you had to become president and COVID. And uh, and the faculty council has, uh, has established a scholarship in both your yes. names that'll be I'm, awarded I've for been, students you know, with LGBTQIA+. Thank you. I, I'm so touched by that that um, by the scholarship that the faculty council created. It. I'm really deeply, deeply touched. And um, you know, Don and I were together for 45 years, and I could not have had the career I had without you know his unwavering support. So. So we just, again, thank the families of LaGuardia who support us when we come home talking about ePortfolio. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the show, folks. Uh, today has been, uh, my guest has been Provost Dr. Paul Arcario, and this has been his exit interview. And Dr. Arcario is leaving LaGuardia at the end of June, uh, not completely, but uh, as a full-time member. After 34 years of service to the college and 40 years of service, to CUNY. I want to thank you uh, and thank everybody who watched and listened. And I look forward to you in your next incarnation as our CTL workshop leader and uh, mindfulness coach. Thank Thanks, you, Paul. You, Thanks, for, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And Mr. Pope, please take us out as we came in with a little more Elton John. Bye-bye.